my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. Uh, we got quite a bit coming at you in this particular episode. We got the return of the Karayan returning from its rescue mission out past the moon. Um, we're also going to get some more uh, in Kerbin atmosphere and on Kerbin surface uh, missions and contracts and some science gathering going. We haven't been doing very much actually within Kerbin's atmosphere. Uh, of late. And speaking of what's been going on of late, the last couple of episodes, there's been, you know, with me, I, I've been bouncing back and forth between missions. It just seemed like I had no time in between those, managing all those missions. And now finally, I actually have a few game hours to start deorbiting uh, some of these debris, the, these ascent stages that have been left behind from my last few launches. And this system is actually starting to work fairly well. It, it's becoming fairly consistent and you know some of the time I end up uh, the, the the recovery goes exceptionally well sometimes perhaps well not so well oops <laughs> oh well you know most of it survived and you know not too far from the Kerbal Space Center so I can't complain and that brings us to Svetlana in a slightly improved Otter 1. It's been a little while since we've seen this plane. And, uh, oh, I just love my new runway. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually, the runway got upgraded a little while ago, but this is my first time using it. Uh, so nice. Anyway, our new thing, our retractable landing gear. Very nice, yes. Retractable landing gear for the first time. Now, Svetlana, where's Svetlana going? Svetlana is on, whoops. <laughs> Svetlana is on her way to Bill's Overlook. Uh, there are actually three sites on the ground there, an Alpha, a Beta, and a Gamma, and she is going to be doing some surface samples. That's a new science that we can now do thanks to the upgrading of our research and development center. So we're going to be going over there not just to fulfill these contracts, but also to collect ourselves some new science. And it was a 750 kilometer journey to Bill's Overlook, uh, which is not insignificant, but uh, well, that's what time warping's for, right? And so it wasn't that big of a deal, certainly well within the range of the Otter 1. In fact, we'll have enough fuel left to get ourselves back to the Kerbal Space Center so we can get 100% recovery on this particular vessel. Um, actually, speaking a bit about the Otter 1, I know it's been a while since you've seen it last. This might end up being the last time you see it as well because uh, coming up on the current tier I'm on on the tech tree there are some better aerodynamic parts coming up including an improved more powerful engine um, I'm hoping that uh, that will allow me to build a vessel that can go higher go faster and go further but uh, time will have to tell on that one because I do have some other things I want to get accomplished first so it's not my highest priority on the tech tree but it's probably running a pretty close second. Anyway, as we close in on our landing site, I can start to see here that it is a little hilly. And if you recall the last time Svetlana had her hands on the controls of this particular plane, well, things didn't quite go so well. She caught herself a bit of an edge of a hill and, uh, well, she survived. Obviously, she's here, but she lost a fair amount of the plane. So uh, we're going to play it a little bit safe here and scout about for a flatter landing spot, put it down in this nice flat area, and just drive over to uh, where we need to take the surface sample. Okay, we are here. Put on the brakes. And all we have to do is take a surface sample. So EVA... And we just need to climb up on top of the vessel. And you don't have to get down to the ground. Right click. Where's that? Oh, take a surface sample right there. An 8.1 science. 8.1 science. I can't complain about that. That's not even all of it. There's more to collect later if I wanted to come back. Yeah, no EVA. 8.1 science. That ain't so bad. Alrighty. Okay, so next one, which one's the closer here? Bill's Overlook Gamma is the closer one, so we'll go to that one next. That's just a little over a kilometer away. And it didn't take too much to just drive over to the other two waypoints. Last one being just uh, an EVA report. Unfortunately, all of this was in the same biome, so those two surface samples were both in grasslands, and I can't store two, so 
Oh well, what can you do? I couldn't store the experiments, but it was then time for us to get out of here and fly on back to the Kerbal Space Center. And it was on my way back that I was thinking, wow, you know, eight science for each of these uh, uh, the, the, the surface samples. <laughs> Sorry about that. Surface samples. And I, I, I rebuilt the science buggy. I actually even redesigned the science buggy a little bit. The science buggy, if you recall, being a little jet car for just getting around near the Kerbal Space Center and going to the various biomes. And I didn't use it because I sat there and said, oh, I don't want to do that silly mission again. But, you know, there's a lot of biomes around the KSC. Eight science per biome? That seems sort of worth it to me, so uh, it's already built, so why don't I get myself out the science buggy and uh, scoop up a little bit more science. So here we have the redesigned science buggy. Um, functionally, it's really exactly the same as the old one. Um, I don't really know why I went and did it. I think I just wanted to put some new parts on there. So the main one being the uh, inline cockpit. I wanted to have something with the inline cockpit in it. I don't know. I also put some headlights on it. I don't know. It looks a little bit better, I think, but it actually is a little less stable um, because it's longer. And that sort of tripod design, it has a little bit more of a tendency to want to uh, to roll over. But anyway, Bob's there, uh, going around the KSC, going to the various biomes, scooping up, for the most part, really just interested in taking those surface samples, which, if you recall, are eight science each. Um, also scrounging out just a little bit more materials-based science. I mean, it's point one, but yeah, what? it's there. <laughs> Might as well take it. You know, and everything was going absolutely fine. You know, very routine mission, right up until the point where I got it into my head that I'm going to drive it right up on top of the launch pad, which isn't even necessary um, because you could just come up beside the launch pad and you're still on the launch pad. And the issue here is, well, it's not like this thing has a reverse. And it's not like there's enough room here to really turn around. So, well, I got it. Well, I, Bob's going to have to get out and push, isn't he? That's, that's what I'm going to have to do. So I got Bob out and we're going to go and we're going to give it a push. And it's, uh, no, it's starting. There we go started to drift forward like it was going to come right off the cliff. And I, sh I don't know, I should be able to push this off, I think. Come on, Bob, you can do it. Science seems to want to even roll itself that way. Try to sort of straighten it out a little bit so it'll go down the ramp. Oh, yes, what? I had to take a surface sample. Almost forgot to do that. And come on, come on. Oh! A light bulb is burned out. No! Oh, dear. Oh, Bob, you got distracted. Oh, this isn't too good. I don't think the likelihood of me being able to flip this over is particularly high. Nope. Nope, Bob's not going to be able to get this thing back onto its wheels. And I'm not going to run around to the other biomes and then come back here to store the science. That's just too much of a pain. I'll have to rebuild the science buggy and uh, give this another try. I do want to see though, like, how many scientists does it take to replace the light bulb? What do you think? Okay, we'll take uh, some spare parts from here, which I'm assuming is light bulbs. I mean, come on, I know you're supposed to have engineers. We'll inspect, and it says, yes, light bulbs, refer. so come on. Scientists should be able to replace a light bulb, right? <gasps> oh, replaced! Bob fixed something! I fixed something! That's my first thing I fixed with, dang it. Very exciting. So you don't need engineers for everything. Changing light bulbs is within the realm of everybody, I suppose. Even that aborted mission netted me almost 65 science for a total of 218 science, which is enough to unlock another tier 6 tech node, but... You know, I'm really eyeing the uh, electronics, which I will be able to unlock as soon as precision engineering is finished being researched, which should happen in just another couple of days. Um, and I want that electronics because I want that Communitron 8888 antenna because I have a Duna window coming up and I need that antenna 
in order to communicate with anything that's heading out towards Duna. So I think what I'll do is I'm just going to save this science. Shouldn't take me too much longer to get the 300. I should have 300 by the time uh, precision engineering is finished being researched. And then I'll think about building myself a Duna probe. And now wanting to get all the science that I can, I popped out to MapSat 2, which is busy mapping the moon. Um, actually, it had a contract to map half the moon, which finished some time ago. And I already had popped out here and scrounged out 22 science from the altimeter scanner. So let's see if there's any else, any more else that's built up here. Another four science. Yeah, we'll transmit that. I mean, every little bit helps. And then we're getting to the time for JunkSat 4 to perform its transfer burn out to Minmus. Oh, frig, we're in eclipse. I'm going to have to pay attention to electricity here. Okay, we're coming up to five minutes to the burn. Turn off the alarm. Um, Yeah, it's a little bit of a pain that we're in eclipse, but it ended up not making any kind of big deal at all and the, the uh, burn went as per normal. The idea here actually is to adjust it so that uh, I want to put it into an equatorial orbit around Minmus with an altitude of 633.75 kilometers. Um, and the reason why I'm going for that is because that gives me a period of four days. Again, this is going to be a communication satellite around Minmus, so I always shoot for periods that um, are easy for me to remember. So if I can get three equally spaced satellites out here all in the same orbit with a period of four days, they will stay within relative position of each other and will form a, an effective communication system. So I ended up with this uh, 67 meter per second correction burn, mostly dealing with the inclination change that I have to do to get out here towards Minmus. Unfortunately, yeah, Minmus is, looks like it's at the high part of its particular orbit, but no big deal. We'll set an alarm for that, which is coming up in a little less than a day. But in the meantime, we have to deal with the Corian, which is on its way back into Kerbin's atmosphere. Now, recall that the Corian cannot land. So the plan was to rendezvous with the Kerstock 5, which we left in low orbit around Kerbin. But if you look closely at low orbit around Kerbin, you will see that there are two ships. The second ship is Chrissy Kerman, another rescue mission, a mission that came up while these guys were on their way back from rescuing Tamley. So, well, we're in the vicinity. We might as well pick her up. We do have the room to hold four Kerbals in this particular capsule. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go for it. But before we can do anything of the sort and start to think about our rendezvous, we're going to need to bring our orbit down. And we're going to do that through arrow braking, which you've seen me do a whole bunch of times in the last few episodes. So I'm not going to spend any time with it other than to let me know, I, I let you know that I did three arrow braking passes to get my orbit down to what you see here. So now I can begin to think about the process of rendezvousing with Chrissy, but before I do anything, I do want to get my periapsis out of Kerbin's atmosphere and get myself into a proper orbit. So I time warped out to apoapsis, burned a little bit prograde just to get the periapsis out of the atmosphere, and then we can start thinking about uh, planning our rendezvous. Now a great place to get started when going from an eccentric orbit into a circular one is where the two orbits come fairly close together, which is going to be at the periapsis. And right away I got encounter nodes that are really close together, but it looks like my inclination is off. Yeah, it looks like my orbit in blue is below the target orbit in yellow. Yeah, and it's there's only a two degree inclination difference between the two orbits, but that seems to be enough. So what I probably should do Okay, let's, mo let's move this out to one of the nodes. The descending node seems to make it worse, so I ended up over at the ascending node, where after a little bit of uh, playing around, including playing around with the timing of the burn, I didn't do the burn right at the ascending node because I do have to think about the encounter, of course. I ended up with an encounter closest approach of uh, only about 100 meters, so more than happy with that. So now it's time to time warp around and perform this burn. Okay, just a little while, oops, put that back onto the node there, 
we'll burn off this last little bit. Okay. Let's get rid of the node, see what we got. 0.4 kilometers, 32 minutes away. Well, I'm more than happy with that. Then I started looking, you know, uh, that, that burn wasn't too much. It was only like 50-something meters per second. Um, but our two orbits here are quite a bit different. So my rendezvous burn at the other end is probably going to be a little bit significant. And I can see here I only have 193 meters per second left. So I thought I'd best uh, prepare myself. <laughs> I'm just curious what this burn's going to be. So all I got to do is put a maneuver node in around where your uh, rendezvous is going to happen. And then, uh, you know, see what kind of a burn it takes to sort of get the two orbits to look about the same. And yeah, that, that ended up taking about 242 meters per second. So in when I get to trying to match velocities with uh, Chrissy's uh, debris there, it's going to take about 240 something meters per second. Oh dear. And I only got 193. But I do have a lot of monoprop. Quite a lot of monoprop. And my instincts tell me, no hard numbers, but I think I should have enough monoprop. I should have more than enough monoprop, I would think. And I mean, when, when you're going to do the rendezvous, speed isn't. You know, how quickly you can perform the burn isn't that big a deal. So thrust to weight ratio is not that big a deal. I think I can pull this off. I maybe should have thought about this a little bit more ahead of time. You know, I, I could have done another very light arrow breaking pass and uh, brought my orbit down a little bit further. That would have made this burn cheaper still. But I got what I got now. So I'm going to have to figure it out one way or another. But... That's going to have to wait just a little bit, because right now uh, the uh, correction burn for Junk Set 4 is coming up. i got to do that. And that burn went without any issues. It was easy enough. Uh, it, you know, it's, not, it's one of these non-time critical burns, so you can just sort of take your time with it. Here, here comes our periapsis. Let's select that. All right, burn a little bit further until I get it where I need it to be. There we go. Oh, wow, that's great. Remember, we're aiming for about 633.7. I'm not going to get any closer than that. Uh, so we won't be revisiting this particular uh, probe until we enter into Mimesis' sphere of influence, which won't be for a little over six days from now. And then we will uh, insert this puppy into its orbit. So let's get ourselves back then to the Karayan 1. So here we are, we're about two and a half minutes from our closest approach, and I'm just putting myself onto the retrograde uh, icon. Of course, I am in target mode, and you can see our relative velocity is about 260 meters per second, which I need to kill off with only 193 meters per second left of liquid fuel and oxidizer. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using the RCS. So what we got? About two two minutes and fifteen seconds. I'm probably gonna start burning a little bit early because I do want to burn early because um oh put on the RCS and that god awful sound that you hear is uh, what happens when I start using the RCS. And at the at the start I had actually no idea right now why, why is it making this sound all of a sudden until I noticed that. Uh, I did upgrade the Interstellar mod, and it has a new folder called RCS Sounds, and this was the sound that it did. Now, I noticed almost immediately afterwards that there was a further update to Interstellar, which I suspect fixed this sound, because this sound just isn't right. So for now, we're just going to have to put up with it. Sorry, but I uh, shouldn't be putting it up with it for too long. If it, if it keeps up sounding annoying, I'm just going to delete these RCS sounds that Interstellar is inserting but in the meantime we are bringing down our relative velocity all I am doing is holding H I'm also moving around where the ship is pointing um you don't just you know when you're this far away you don't just herd 
the retrograde vector icon onto the target icon, it's not quite as simple as that because your paths are not straight lines. They are curves. And so I'm just playing around with it. And here I can see I'm now starting to bring down my separation. It was at one kilometer. Now it's down to 0.9 kilometers. And again, right now, all I'm doing is RCS. My relative velocity is down to about 210 meters per second. Once I get it below 196 meters per second, then I'm golden. And I think that's going to happen without too much issue. I am keeping an eye on my monoprop up there on the right, but I still got tons and tons of monopropellant left. No issues at all. One thing to notice is my time to my closest encounter continues to go down um, because I'm not thrusting enough to push it away. So I'm thinking I'm probably going to need to get a little bit of liquid fuel in there. I think so. Yeah, but my, my, my relative velocity is now below my delta V, so I am, we're going to pull this off. No issues. Let's let's start giving ourselves a little bit of thrust. Just a little bit. Just so that I'm not coming closer to that encounter. Oh, seems to be well, one minute and nine seconds to my closest encounter. Separation's down to 0.6 kilometers. Seems to be sticking at one minute and nine seconds. I'd like to start to push it up just a little bit, a little bit more throttle. So now I'm I'm still pushing with RCS, so I still have my my finger on the H key. And I am also giving myself a little bit of thrust with the main engines. Oh, my separation is down to 0.2 kilometers, and I'm starting to push my time to my closest approach further away. My relative velocity is now down to just about 120 meters per second. I still have 140 meters per second left in the can. Uh, no problem. This will be this will be done without any issues. And we're now within a kilometer of our target doing our final approach using a combination of both the main engine and wow I really hate that sound I hope when I upgrade interstellar that that's gonna go away or at least be a lot less annoying using a combination of the main engine and RCS I want to conserve as much liquid fuel as I can considering I really don't have that much left I mentioned back when I set up my original burn to do the rendezvous that uh, if you're going from an elliptical orbit into a circular orbit, uh, the best place to at least get started with where to do that transfer burn is at periapsis. And that's once again because uh, if you're burning prograde or retrograde, the most efficient place to do that is going to be at periapsis where you are moving the most quickly. Of course, you might, because you're doing a rendezvous, you're going to have to tweak it. And in my case, I ended up having to make quite an inclination change, so I ended up having to move away from that. But it's always a good place to sort of at least get started. There we go, we got our relative velocity down to under 4 meters per second. I think we'll just kind of follow this on home from here on in. Then I'm going to have to think as well about how I'm going to get at least Tamley and uh, Chrissy here back down. Jebediah and Glafia, they're going to stay with the Karayan. Um, I do have the Curse Dock 5 in orbit. I don't think... I, I think what I'll do is I'll actually just leave this guy here and bring the Curse Dock 5 to it. The Curse Dock 5 has quite a lot of fuel left in it. And I'm just going to bring my relative velocity down to zero here. We're close enough. Oh, 0.1 meter per second. That's good enough. Let's switch over to Chrissy and get her over here. There we go. Chrissy, by the way, is a scientist. You can see the little icon, uh, little beaker next to her picture. Now it's gone, but it was there just for a second. She's also in blue. I just found out as well that um, you can set up the texture replacement mod to take a look at the class and pick specific uniforms for specific classes so it'll do it automatically. So that's great. So uh, yeah, I got myself another scientist. What I'd really like to do is get myself another engineer and then, then, then that's great. Then I got a bunch of pilots, two, three scientists, three engineers. That would be, I think, ideal. But anyway, as she gets herself into the capsule, I do think I'm going to have to be drawing this particular episode to a close. We'll leave the getting them back home till the next episode. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.